James Hale, who is the political correspondent of The Spectator. Just to get a, a sense, really, of everything that's around today, everything I want to hear from you on 0344 499 1000 about. Uh, James, you're very welcome to Talk TV. Good afternoon. Afternoon, Peter. Um, I mean, today, Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor, first of all, summoning in the banks, talking to them about mortgages, the interest rate shock yesterday up 0.5 uh, percentage points in terms of uh, interest rates at 5%, the highest since the crash in 2008. This is serious, serious trouble. What can the banks actually do? What can Jeremy Hunt actually do, especially when he's not the one who controls interest rates? We've heard, of course, from Rishi Sunak about the, fi about the five pledges he has. One of them is to have inflation. Just unpack this issue for us and, and tell people what the kind of issues are around this and what power Jeremy Hunt actually has. Yeah, so this morning, Jeremy Hunt met with the leaders of some of the UK's biggest banks. Uh, we're expecting a statement on how those talks went uh, shortly in the next couple of hours or so. Um, but really, this was today about encouraging the banks to pass on those kind of rate rises uh, in, to savers as well, partly, but also to ensure that any kind of um, you know, a mortgage which we're going to be potentially defaulted on uh, is, is a potential to get a sort of holiday on those payments. So rather than paying back sort of mortgage and interest, it would just be purely paying interest payments on that. So that's believed to have been the kind of crux of the discussion today. This that's flexibility, sorry to interrupt you, this flexibility, James, this, this ability to make temporary changes to mortgage terms, being able to uh, return to their original deal within six months, there has been some progress here, hasn't there? Yes, there has, and that's going to be the basis of the, the of what what the sort of discussions are today, which is that um, they, they, the banks are willing to agree to some of those conditions. Uh, they want to pass that on and uh, ensure that they don't have to get too many sort of defaulted payments. Um, so that's really been what I've been talking to MPs about today, and I think there's a sense that. Uh, most Conservative MPs accept that they're not going to be able to kind of have the kind of package that the Liberal Democrats want to have, which is a mortgage relief package of around three billion or so. But there are, I'd say, talking to about you know, but ten or twenty MPs who are really particularly concerned about this. Some of them have gone public with their issues. They want to have a more sort of interventionist package, which uh, you know we've seen with COVID, we've seen with furlough before, and obviously with the energy price guarantee as well last year. And that's people like Jake Berry who stood up in the House of Commons and demanded it. So I think there's a sense, perhaps, that the, the banks are willing to work on this. But the question is whether it's going to be enough. And I think there's going to be political pressure for more for the Chancellor, even though, as you say, Peter, uh, he doesn't have the kind of interest, he doesn't have the tools that pre-1997 successive Chancellors had, which would have been able to control interest rates themselves. The good news is for mortgage holders as well that this change is, and Mr Honda said, the temporary flexibility on switching terms is not going to affect credit scores as well. Because there are so many people who are thinking interest rates going up, payments going up, you're paying you know, a lot more money for exactly the same thing, which is essentially just to keep a roof over your head. Well, completely, yes. And obviously, you've got all the different pressures that inflation is putting on other parts of the economy as well. So everything, you know, prices are going up as well. Uh, you've obviously, from the national picture as well, got issues around debt. So debt now is obviously bigger than 100% of GDP for the first time since 1961. And that's being all the sort of effects on the ground are that we're seeing people's pay packet get eaten up by inflation. And at the same time, you know, if the if more and more possessions take into place, that could lead to a potential collapse in the housing market and obviously ramifications for the rest of the UK economy well, because so much of the UK's wealth is tied up with property. In terms of uh, the other big issue that people are talking about today, seven years since the Brexit vote and the real suspicion that Keir Starmer's Labour are going soft on this, that they're thinking uh, we might rejoin the EU in some way. I, I mean, they would deny that, of course, and Keir Starmer would say that he believes Brexit is working. He has said that anyway. Um, in terms of where things are on this, we have a poll from YouGov just released in the last hour or so saying that half, more than half, of British people would vote to rejoin. Uh, what sort of... Is this a sort of done and dusted argument in Westminster, the people you're talking to, the, the, the pulses on which you have a finger, James, or is this a real discussion? So I think that there is a powerful rejoin movement in the country. The question is, how will that be expressed? Uh, you know, I've tried to sort of, I'd love to get the big story about Labour's sort of secret plan to sort of rejoin the EU. I don't think that that's going to be any time soon, this side of um, an election or the next one, actually. I think potentially it could be something we see the one after this one, one after 2024, five years down the line. There are certainly, uh, you know, Labour is now, in, in the Leavers who supported Bre Brexit on the Labour side have mostly retired from Parliament, so it's almost entirely 100% Remain party. Uh, and it, remain, it will be interesting to see kind of those voices within the party, uh, people who've been sort of very pro-European, like Darren Jones, Stella Creasy, whether they will have an increased role in any Starmer administration. Um, but I think we can already see that, you know, people like David Lamy are willing to talk about Europe, and it's sort of 
it's much more kind of coded broad general sentiments like we need a closer tie with europe etc mm. we want to be working with our friends and partners uh I, in terms of a formal push i can't see full fat membership rejoining i can see probably single market potentially being something of an issue it also depends on how you know the government performed after the next election if yeah. say yeah. coalition or confidence supply with the lib dems that could be different mm, absolutely the other big story of course that people are talking about today james not a political story but a story that has not gripped the world is the titanic sub crew they have uh, apparently they apparently died instantly in a catastrophic implosion. What do you make of this story in terms of the focus that's been on it, the drama around it, and the fact that the US authorities, the US uh, Navy, apparently knew on Sunday night that it was highly likely that this catastrophic implosion had happened and the whole drama over whether they had oxygen or not appears to have been almost a moot point by that stage? Yeah, completely. I think there will be questions asked about the Coast Guard and why they didn't share this information sooner. It's been an absolutely gripping story, as you said, absolute tragic ending. Um, and I think it's a number of things. It was obviously, you know, the, the irony of the Titan, the Titanic, etc. the sort of grim fascination we all have with that incredible story 111 years ago. I think really, I mean, the lesson of the Titanic in 1912 was that mercifully as a result of that terrible tragedy, there were a huge number of improvements brought in, things like new lifeboats, etc., regulations on ships. Uh, nothing ever had been allowed to occur in quite the same way. And one would hope that from this, from the Titan, the, the loss of these five lives, we we're going to see some lessons learned, which will prevent uh, this happening and also things as well like the US Coast Guard response which I think has um, not entirely been perfect in all of this. Yes indeed, we've got about a month to go between now and parliamentary recess, just back to politics and, and yeah. before parliamentarians go on their holiday and so on. What, what are the sort of big things that you expect to happen between now and then? Because there's a lot coming up isn't there? Uh, we know of course that uh, Rishi Sunak is going to be concentrating on the economy, that's going to be his number one priority, small boats and, and the NHS, we know about that. But what else is kind of coming up and what do you expect Labour to do? Because they're doing quite well at the moment, uh, sort of mm -hmm. quietly getting on with things and riding high in the opinion polls. Yeah, I mean, it, it does come back to those sort of issues which Rishi Sunak has identified, right? Those five priorities in the sense that uh, obviously the economy is going to be the huge battleground and it's going to be dominating the next few weeks and months. And obviously those pressures aren't going anywhere. But also I think migration will be a key one because I think we're going to see summer weather means more people coming here, frankly. We're also going to see hopefully the Court of Appeal is going to make that judgment on the Rwanda deportation scheme. Uh, and then it presumably will be going to the Supreme Court because whoever wins, they're going to fight it either yes, way. The others. yes. And so I think those are a few things. Also, the OECD index of the NHS and what global healthcare systems are coming out. So I think there will be sort of pressure on talking about the NHS reform argument as well. So really, I think it's all about going to be the economy and migration. And you've also got the migration bill coming back from the House of Lords to the Commons for a final showdown. So it's going to be those questions. And whether Rishi Sunak, he set himself these tests, will he make the mark? No doubt we'll talk more about that as time goes on. James Hale, political correspondent The Spectator, thank you so much. Appreciate your thoughts on that. And thanks to everybody who's been in touch already. Uh, we're going to take as many calls as we can between now and four o'clock. But let me read out some texts in the meantime. Hey, Peter, Connor in Belfast here. Hello, Connor. I use a parking app here and it's actually really easy to use. I'm not a fan of going cashless, but this is a rare exception. Connor, that's fine for you. But I mean, there are members of my family for I know would really struggle to use an app to do uh, parking. And I do sort of slightly worry that there are are people who just you know can't use these or would have trouble using these or, or whatever. Um, Connor says also I wouldn't attend Glastonbury for any man's money. I don't even watch it on the telly. Well well done Connor. I don't watch it on the telly either. I hate Glastonbury. I hate the camping. It's awful. I hate the music. I hate the people. Um, I hate everything about Glastonbury. I would abolish it um, quite frankly. But you know people do have freedom which is obviously a bad thing when it comes to Glastonbury. Uh, I'm joking. I'm joking. People can, can do whatever they want. Although whether we should be paying for the four million billion squillion BBC employees who go there all I'm sure working incredibly hard uh, to bring us the Glastonbury coverage and not just there on a jolly. Uh, Christine and Surrey has been in touch. Brexit. Wish more in the UK had more patriotism. There was no will amongst the chattering classes or most in Westminster for Brexit to ever work. In fact they did and continue to scupper it ever happening. It was never set up to be the United States of Europe and this is what happened when those in power abused their positions. Well, do you agree with Connor? Do you agree with Christine? What do you think about this? Seven years on from Brexit, are you happy with how it's working? Uh, did you vote for it? Or do you feel that you've got what you voted for? Brexit means Brexit, Theresa May said, but what did that actually mean? Do we have those freedoms that you were promised? Do you feel we've taken back control of our laws, our money and our borders? 0344 499 1000 would love to hear from you. Uh, text me on 87222 with the word talk in your text. You can tweet me at Talk TV or uh, follow me on Twitter at Peter Cardwell. Uh, you can do that as well. We're going to be talking to John Redwood, Sir John Redwood, the Conservative MP for Wokingham, about mortgages and indeed about Brexit in just a few minutes here on Talk TV.